Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, once again, let me greet and welcome to Georgia. And this is our la third day and the last day. Hope you are not very much tired after very, very extensive discussions for the last three days. Uh, with this panel, effective strategies for leaving no one behind and increasing access to legal aid for marginalized groups, I believe we have very interesting follow-up discussion to the panel one of today because we just discussed the discrimination of mar and marginalization in the criminal justice systems and now we can discuss and elaborate further how to increase the access to legal aid service. And as very rightly mentioned by all speakers in the previous session, uh, access to legal aid is vital not only for the criminal justice uh, systems, but also for civil and administrative cases. So if you somehow could also just mention very briefly how to increase the access to the legal aid, legal aid for elimination, discrimination of marginalized groups would be also very much interesting. I have also one request to all speakers. Maybe we could speak only for seven minutes, seven, ten maximum. Then uh, let's leave some time for the questions and answers to address the questions that our listeners might have for this very, very important and sensitive issue. Thank you so much. And the first speaker is Professor David McQuid Mason, who is the professor of law at Center of Social, so Social Legal Studies, University of KwaZulu Natal. And I do believe everybody remembers him as the most time efficient person throughout the whole session. Thank you. Just while the technology is getting organized. Um, I'm breaking one PowerPoint rule. I've got too much information. That's the bad news. The good news is I'm only going to talk for half a minute on each, each slide. I made it detailed so that you can use it as a resource afterwards. How are we doing, Wendy? We're not. Okay. I'm going to be talking about leave nobody behind, the role of non-lawyers in countries where there are very few lawyers. That's really what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to relate it to the UN um, principles and guidelines. Um, and <coughs> guideline 14 and 16 talk particularly about using paralegals where there is a shortage of lawyers, and particularly in rural and economically um, <coughs> disadvantaged, disadvantaged areas. We've heard a lot about paralegals. When I prepared this document, I'm really, really referring to countries I've worked with, but we know paralegals in Sierra Leone are appointed. Okay, we got it. I'm going to go straight in. Yeah, thanks. Yep. Um, Sierra Leone has paralegals posted at, at every rural chief's place. So out in the rural areas, they have traditional authorities. They've all got paralegals, either paid for by legal aid board, by, by CSOs. We've heard that recently um, Kenya, Tanzania, Zambia have all passed laws now that recognize paralegals, all drawing on, on the principles of the UN principles and guidelines. The other thing uh, that is also mentioned in these guidelines is representation for victims and witnesses. And you heard earlier it's being done in Brazil. Kenya has particularly in their act a provision in their latest legal act dealing with that as, as well. Um, an important principle and one that hasn't had a lot of, e it's had a lot of emphasis here but not really a session, is the, pr the introduction to the principle talking about legal education and public awareness. Very, very important. Um, and also alternative dispute resolution is mentioned. We haven't heard much of that here. The legal empowerment document talks about it, particularly in post-colonial countries where you've got ADR as a traditional thing existing for thousands of years. We've tried to put it in legislation to say, use your traditional authorities. I don't know where I am on the slides now. Use your traditional authorities to solve problems provided they're consistent with human rights and your constitution. Then there's a provision all about dealing with marginalized groups. You've just heard about that in, in the last session. Um, and then after that, the question of making it 
sustainable and so on. Many of us have now included those sort of provisions in the new legislation. The big thing about all legal aid is political will. Um, I've been very lucky in my country that out of our past, many when the new government came, people came in, they were the victims of an oppressive criminal justice system. So they've been very supportive of, of, of legal aid. To my surprise, I found that Fiji gives $3 per capita for legal aid for that little country, which is equivalent to the budget that the Directorate of Public Prosecutions gets. It must be the only country in the world where funding for legal aid matches the actual budget of the prosecuting authority. They'd give twice what we do. South Africa's about 1.6, but you've got the political will to do that. Then um, you, And to get that political will, we must use documents like the UN principles and, and, and guidelines. Um, I've, I've mentioned public legal awareness already. Um, mixed system of, of delivery as well. The whole question of education, using all available um, resources. And again, I've just put there for you later to read for yourselves. But the, these have been included, including a provision in the legal aid legislation imposing a duty on prosecutors, police officers, prison officials to notify people about their right to, to legal aid uh, as well. Um, we've done that. Oh, let me come back. One of the things is encouraging bar associations and others to assist. Now, pro bono hasn't been spoken about at this conference, but can sometimes be used as a stopgap measure. You obviously cannot run a legal aid scheme on pro bono. They tried it in South Africa, it failed. Use it as a stopgap, but some countries have used it creatively. Um, where you have lawyers who have to renew their license every year, it could make a provision. They've got to do so many pro bono cases. Nigeria, before a lawyer who's a, an advocate wants to become a senior advocate, he has to satisfy that he's done a requisite number of pro bono cases as well. So pro bono should be used as a backstop where you have got a shortage of lawyers as well. Um, the, this is the Bar, Bar Association pro bono. I've just spoken about that. Um, question of paralegals, we've been speaking about them, not in a lot of detail about what they do. In Fiji, which they now have a 24-hour system within one hour, they will send their paralegal there first to take out the documentary evidence about where, where was the person arrested, from the place of arrest to where, when did they come to the police station, how many hours lapsed before that, were they injured, all the sort of things that happened to them. The paralegal has a checklist, and once the checklist has been done, the paralegal gets, then gets hold of a, a, a lawyer to come along and sit in on the interview, which is video recorded. So the paralegals are a very useful bridge. There are all sorts of mechanisms. Many of the legal aid um, boards, actually in our country, Legal Aid South Africa, employs paralegals to do the preliminary work, the screening and so on. They go out to the jails and, to, and find out which prisoners need new legal aid. So we need to do a lot more about paralegals and their recognition. Um, we've just heard recently Zambia is now recognizing them. They've got three categories of paralegals depending on their qualifications. It's in legislation there. The other group that's spoken about are law students. Now, we haven't heard much about them in this conference at all. But law students are a privileged group, particularly in developing countries where they exist in a sea of poverty. You need to use those students. Our system in South Africa, which spends 90% of the budget, more or less, on criminal cases because of the Constitution, they contract out to the law clinics to do the civil cases for them. So law clinics, like other CSOs, can be used. In places like India and the Philippines, during the holidays, the law students go home to their villages and towns and they can do community legal awareness. They're a wonderful resource if you can use them properly, and I think we need to spend more time to talking about them as well. So paralegals and, and law students, and the, the UN principles and guidelines say one should even look at student practice rules where it might be okay for them to practice. The Philippines has had this for years by a um, directive fr from their Supreme Court. That is possible. There seems to be a nervousness 
in some of our developing countries that are post-colonial, who've still sort of got the mindset of their colonial masters, they think always about, but even in places like England, law students can appear in certain tribunals. In my country, they can appear in consumer courts and things to assist people. So that is another area that, that needs to be flagged. So I just want to say that the UN principles and guidelines are there. Have a look at them. Have a look at what, what I've done here. Think about your own countries where you can use these resources. We've got, <coughs> I remember once doing a, a workshop in Vanuatu, and after we had the workshop, someone from one of the other Pacific countries said, I never realized, but we live in a forest of resources. We just don't know what everybody's doing, and we don't use everybody's resources. So I'd implore you to do that. A footnote for themes for the fourth conference. One, I think we need to have a discussion on the role of law clinics. There's a network of 65 countries with law clinics. We need to hear their experiences, how they can supplement legal aid. Legal awareness. There's street law and legal awareness programs at universities in 45 countries. We can hook them up with you as well if you want to hear about that. We need to get countries that are post-colonial to talk about using traditional methods of resolving disputes where 80% of the people are probably using traditional methods within a human rights framework. And Lastly, I think we should have some feedback from regions, what regional networks have been set up since this last conference. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor, for uh, mentioning very, very important issues like the strength empowering the right holders because uh, unless the people know have a very good understanding and knowledge of the legal aid services or available through paralegals or the legal aid services or the pro bono services they are not going to use that use it and obviously empowering the right holders should be also one of the major targets of the activities uh, so our next speech is very interesting providing legal aid services to women in Argentina by Nicolas Laino, public defender from Argentina, as you can guess from the even name of this speech. Being like the 50, more than 50% of the world population, women are still considered to be the marginalized groups, group. So we need to address the issue of women in this very, very specific uh, a specific session dedicated to marginalized groups. Well, we don't expect, as women don't expect, to be considered as such, but the reality tells us differently. So, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Uh, first of all, I'd like to express my deepest gratitude to all the institutions that, uh, and individual persons that made this even possible. Uh, I know how hard it is to, to organize uh, a conference in, of this proportion. Since two, two years ago, I was in the same position uh, as local co-host of the second international conference. So we are dealing with Catherine's visas, translations, accommodations, and everything is, it needs to, put, to be to put together. So I just want to congratulate you. The conference uh, hasn't finished yet, but I think we all agree that it's been, uh, it's been so far a great success. And we'll all go back home with new ideas. Uh, to deal with uh, the several problems each of us uh, face uh, in our respective countries and realities in the context of this critical cri crisis on access to legal assistance, uh, especially for the poor and, and vulnerable. I especially like to mention the, the ILF for uh, permitting me participating in, the, in, in this conference. So having said that, uh, I'm supposed to, to talk about legal aid for women. Uh, so, as you may already know, Principle 10 and Guideline 11 of the UN Principles and, and Guidelines uh, call on states to take special measures to protect and, uh, and um, uh, warranty meaningful access to legal, uh, legal aid for, for different specific groups and uh, women are included among them. And then in Guideline 11, it says that states should take, uh, um, the, the needs of, specific, of these specific groups should be taken into account by states when designing uh, uh, the nationwide legal aid schemes. In the Americas, in 2008, the 14th uh, Ibero-American uh, Judicial Summit uh, approved the Brasilia regulations on uh, access to justice for the vulnerable people, where many directives were established for justice operators in order to uh, break the barriers that exist between certain sectors of the society and the justice system. As an institutionally and functionally independent legal aid system from the Office of the Federal Public Defender of Argentina, 
we are unable to organize uh, and manage uh, the, the, our office in the best provision of the service, in the interest of the best provision of the service. And as we also have and manage our own budget, the highest authority of, of our institution, the, the Defender Gerard, has been able to pass different resolutions, um, uh, adopting novel measures and creating new structures to facilitate uh, actor, um, uh, access to legal assistance uh, for different groups. Uh, it is important to, uh, to bear in mind uh, that vulnerability does not only or necessarily means poverty. Uh, there are many situations that can make a person vulnerable be be before the justice system, and for this reason, our activity as public defenders or legal aid providers cannot limit to provide just for a technical uh, defense blind to those singularities uh, of the person or group of person that we are representing. In 2015, uh, the organic law of our Federal Public Defender Office, a new law, uh, that is our Legal Aid Act in Argentina, reaffirmed our position, the Federal Public, Office, uh, Public Defender's Office position, as an institution for the defense and protection of human rights, warranting access to justice and integral legal assistance, uh, and I quote, which promotes measures to protect and defend fundamental rights of people, in particular of those who are in a situation of vulnerability. Regarding women, we have uh, within our office three main programs that care about their particular situation. Uh, we have a commission on gender issues, um, then we have a program on legal aid to confined women, and then there is a program uh, for legal aid to women victims of human trafficking. Uh, the commission on gender issues, it was created in 2007, uh, and since its creation, uh, it's been s striving for the inclusion of uh, gender considerations in the public defense service, seeking to facilitate women's access to justice, uh, providing better defense uh, to the rights and promoting the implementation uh, of defense strategies with a gender um, perspective, in particular in cases where women uh, are criminal prosecuted uh, and they have been previously victims of gender-based violence. The staff of the commission are lawyers who belong to our office and they have a specific training in international human rights and criminal law with orientation to gender issues. The Commission, among other um, functions, is entitled to directly or indirectly uh, take part in the creation of defense strategies that may be required by the public defenders of all the country. Uh, it, uh, it's also entitled to carry out programs to raise awareness of fundamental rights uh, of women, and also it implements all the trainings, activities on gender issues that uh, all members of the Public Defender Office uh, must go through. No, just three minutes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, must go through um, to uh, mandatory seminars. Regarding the last competence, it's important to remark that regardless the support uh, that the public defenders can ask to the commission experts, all of the members of the institution must take part of mandatory trainings every year which cover wide-ranging issues such as the right to equality, uh, the principle of, no, of non-discrimination, uh, and international human rights standards on, on uh, discrimination and violence against women. Uh, as for the defense strategies, in our everyday work, uh, criminal public defenders, uh, we often find situations uh, where the accused woman, for example, of having murdered uh, her husband, uh, or having killed her newborn child, uh, or of abortion, which is a crime in Argentina still, uh, has been victim of abuses or gender-based violence in the past. So with the help of the specific reports that the staff of the commission prepares as support staff uh, for the public defenders, uh, may, that they are made through deep interviews, not only with the defendant, but also with people from their family uh, and their social context. We have had success uh, obtaining acquittals or at, at least uh, penalty reductions due to a decreased uh, culpability. Another living guideline of the work of the Commission lies in the situation of women who are in prison, uh, who are deprived of liberty. Uh, the Commission, what uh, does is to produce reports in the matter that is requested, are requested also by public defenders uh, to support house arrest or domicile arrest for mothers who are in charge of children. And these reports have been uh, really useful also to obtain uh, uh, positive court uh, uh, results. Um, then, um, we also, uh, in Argentina, uh, do strategic litigation on issues regarding discrimination based on gender motivations. Uh, we recently, for example, obtained a, a judgment uh, in a class action run by the Public Defender Office uh, uh, regarding a private city bus company that uh, would not hire women as, as bus drivers. Uh, then also about the right to abortion, and there is also 
uh, uh, very hard work in a collective habeas corpus to prevent uh, transgender population uh, that is in prison to be uh, subjected to invasive and human and non-gender based uh, and non-gender sensitive body searches uh, when where they are transferred from prisons to, to the courts. Uh, regarding representation of women victims, just a quick uh, mention to it because it's quite important. Uh, in 2009, our office created a specialized uh, uh, staff uh, of, uh, of lawyers. Uh, there are now 24 lawyers, uh, three, uh, three law students, two social workers, and two persons from the Ministry of Tax, uh, which uh, warranty um, legal representation, uh, advice and representation for, women's, uh, for women victims, uh, um, victims of gender-based violence. Between 2009, here we have some, uh, some numbers. Uh, this is the number of persons we have um, uh, represented uh, uh, since uh, 2009, 20,000 and 4,500 of them uh, have been uh, represented before civil courts in order to obtain mainly rest uh, um, restraint orders against their uh, aggressors. Uh, and due to the, due to the, high, uh, the huge uh, demand uh, that we have, uh, we have established offices of that uh, specific sector uh, of legal aid for victims uh, within the neighborhoods in the city, uh, in the city of, uh, of uh, uh, the most poor neighborhoods and unprivileged neighborhoods in the city of Buenos Aires. Um, I don't want to take time from our speakers. Uh, I can go deeper uh, regarding uh, the program we had for legal aid for, to confine women, which is especially uh, on civil uh, legal issues of women who are uh, between in jail, for example, regarding problems with the families, uh, with the uh, tenure of their children, and many issues that come up when they go into prison and that really worry and, and creates uh, a lot of uh, uh, of, of like sad situations to them. So um, we have also uh, lawyers who are working on civil issues for confined women. Uh, and then we also, uh, uh, at the last but not least, uh, our office has created uh, two years ago a special division that warranties access to free legal advice and also legal uh, representation uh, for victims, uh, women victims of human trafficking, which is uh, sadly a, a, a phenomenon that is growing in, in, in our region, especially in Argentina. Uh, so we provide uh, legal advice and representation before criminal and civil courts to prosecute, uh, privately prosecute the, um, uh, the uh, victimizers and also to claim for economic uh, compensation. So well, I'm out of time, so thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you so much sharing the experience from Argentina about protection of rights of women that the legal aid service provide how the legal aid service provides really the services to the women whether victims or the those accused in violation of cert certain laws uh, with the world where we have more than 25 million refugees i believe that we cannot really achieve 2030 agenda and the whole idea leaving no one behind unless we provide fear and uh, fear access to justice for those who were forced to flee their homes. Uh, due to the recent developments, Turkey was receiving country for a big number of refugees and I believe the Turkey representatives are really very well positioned to share with us the experience how to ensure that the refugees who are in the most vulnerable situation have access to justice through the relevant representation of a lawyer. So uh, let me introduce Mr. Unsel Toker, Vice President of Union of Bar Associations of Turkey, who will be discussing Turkey experience concerning providing legal aid to the uh, Syrian refugees. Please. Sayın Başkan, saygıdeğer meslektaşlarım, Değerli katılımcılar, hepinizi şahsım Türkiye Barolar Birliği yönetimi adına en içten duygularımla selamlıyorum. Sözlerime öncelikle bizleri buraya davet eden organizatörlere teşekkür ederek başlamak istiyorum. Saygıdeğer dostlar, dünya değişiyor. Dünya ile birlikte biz hukukçuların bildikleri de değişiyor. Bildiklerimizi hep birlikte yeniden gözden geçirmemiz gerekiyor. Çaresiz. Ünlü Türk düşünürü Mevlana ki sanıyorum siz de onu tanıyor olabilirsiniz. 
Dün dünde kaldı, bugün yeni şeyler söylememiz lazım, cancağızım sözleriyle yıllar önce bu durumu veciz ancak öngörülü bir biçimde ortaya koymuştur. Türkiye, Suriye'deki iç savaş sonrası oluşan büyük bir göç dalgası sonunda üç buçuk milyon Suriyeli mülteciyi ülkesinde misafir etmek zorunda kalmıştır. Bitmedi. Bunun yanı sıra Irak'tan, Afganistan'dan, İran'dan, Afrika'dan ve diğer ülkelerden ülkemize gelen 500 milyon, 500 bin kişi daha bu sayıya katıldığında mülteci toplamı nüfusu 4 milyona ulaşmıştır. 4 milyon. Bu sayı dünyadaki birçok ülkenin toplam nüfusundan fazladır. Dikkatinizi çekmek istiyorum. Bizler 79 Türk Barosu olarak ve onların üst kuruluşu Türkiye Barolar Birliği olarak kendi yurttaşlarımız için vermek Bey, da şevkmenit stratejiye emisat hissro mesel gazrede boli. O mumsahire mumsahure bismi çöldü. Ben çöni esegi ne beni pişire bistuys emisat o mesko peri asevre xal emisat o mesko peli old avile bismat tuys ayam prensibiden kamam dinare ru maravi ne onda darçes esegi a ukurat kabul. Çöni mesela dedi ukurat kabul ista dedi sibtxilit ve kide boy tam saketiz. Turkeci ayam mutsamulo bispaglebşi xortselde ba projekti. Yoldulu dağma by the Union of Turkish Bar Associations. The purpose of the project was to collect the basic data and suggest practical solutions to the challenges faced in practice. This project also aimed to strengthen the capacity of legal aid and mandatory defense services provided to the indigents who cannot afford legal aid under the scope of Code of Criminal Procedure, Code of Civil Procedure, and Attorneyship Code. The project had five components. In the first component, since the Turkish Bar Associations used different automation systems to appoint the mandatory defenders in criminal cases, there are some problems, and because of those problems, the Union of Turkish Bar Associations undertook some efforts to ensure the uniformity between those appointment systems at higher quality. And we attained a great deal of progress under this component. Under the second component, attorneys have to improve themselves on a continuous basis. In this scope, Rather than legal education or legal training, lawyers who work with the disadvantaged groups, such as women, children, refugees, disabled individuals, were trained on the attitudes and behavioral approaches to these groups, taking into account their needs. So lawyers who work with these groups receive the training courses. In the third component, considering that legal aid has an impact and is the basis for access to justice and fair trial, performance assessment criteria for legal aid lawyers were developed and our activities are still ongoing under this component. Fourth component. In order to strengthen cooperation, professional collaboration, and knowledge exchange between legal aid lawyers, several regional meetings have been organized to enable lawyers and bar associations to exchange their views, experience, and knowledge. Fifth component. On the, the scope of this component, Independent experts conducted a needs analysis to identify the problems and challenges faced by refugees for more effective access to legal aid. According to the needs identified through this study, a 
strategy training was designed and delivered to legalate lawyers who work with refugees in seven provinces in Turkey that were most densely populated by Syrian refugees. And also, a strategic paper on institutional measures was drafted in order to increase the access of refugees to legal aid services. And new projects were developed according to the requirements listed in this paper. Under this scope, a legal clinic was set up by the Union of Turkish Bar Associations in a province that was most densely populated by Syrians. The clinic has four lawyers, one psychologist, three interpreters and support staff. On the other hand, Interpreter helpline was created by the union to provide interpreting services to indigents across the entire country. This helpline immediately provides interpreting support in Arabic and Persian to lawyers and bar associations during legal aid applications and process and interviews with their lawyers. Finally, in order to diversify the funds, given, given that the financial resources are scarce, Legal Aid joint project was developed and we received a moderate fund from the European Union for this project. In this project, funds are used directly to ensure the sustainability of Legal Aid services provided to refugees. So it was my pleasure to share our good practices in these projects implemented to improve access to legal aid and achieve the principle of leaving no one behind. On my behalf and on behalf of the Union of Turkish Bar Associations, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. And to the point uh, presentation. So you very rightly mentioned that the lawyers don't necessarily be the only the lawyers. They also need to have the behavioral skills, how to treat the refugees or other marginalized groups to make sure that the uh, relevant uh, services and relevant care is provided to the groups that are considered to be marginalized due to the different reasons. Uh, the next... Uh, topic shall be dedicated to the provision of legal aid services to the persons with disabilities. Uh, yes, to, yes, the persons with disabilities and vulnerable groups in general. Yes, Loic's speech. Спасибо. Уважаемые участники конференции, позвольте еще раз поблагодарить организаторов данной конференции за приглашение и возможность выступить перед такой уважаемой и высокой аудиторией. И, как уже объявили, мой доклад, моя презентация будет посвящена оказанию юридической помощи уязвимым слоям общества, в том числе лицам с инвалидностью. И позвольте короткую информацию о самом Таджикистане, поскольку мой доклад будет посвящен именно опыту Таджикистана. 93% территории нашей страны составляют горе, то есть мы горная страна. 70% населения нашей страны проживает в сельской местности и 30% являются малоимущими. Мы тоже относимся к странам постсоветского пространства в Центральной Азии, и мы граничим с Узбекистаном, Кыргызстаном, Афганистаном и Китаем. Правовую основу предоставления правовой, информ... правовой помощи лицам с инвалидностью, естественно, составляет во-первых, Конституция Республики Таджикистан и международные правовые документы и обязательства, которые Таджикистан принял на себя. И еще один документ, который непосредственно касается данного процесса, является стратегия социально-экономического развития Республики Таджикистан на 2016-2030 годы, которая в целом гармонично сочетается с целями устойчивого развития и в том числе за ЦУР-16. Главным документом, правовым актом, который регулирует нашу деятельность, является концепция по оказанию 
бесплатной правовой помощи в Республике Таджикистан, принятой в 2015 году. Для реализации данной концепции было образовано наше учреждение при Министерстве юстиции Центр правовой помощи. Целем э, этой концепции является формирование основ и дальнейшее совершенствование системы предоставления юридической помощи. И данная концепция э, предназначена, реализация данной концепции предусмотрена на 8 лет и в два этапа. Первый этап – это период пилотирования, поскольку концепция предусматривает пилотирование различных моделей, а второй этап – это переходный период. А пилотный период финансирования нашей деятельности в основном происходит за счет донорских средств. На сегодняшний день нашими донорами являются UNDP и SDC, швейцарский офис по, развитию, по сотрудничеству. Я не буду подробно останавливаться на модели, но могу сказать, что одна из моделей, предусмотренной концепцией, как бы направлена на достижение именно принципа «не оставлять никого в стороне», поскольку помимо юридических консультаций и Юридической помощи еще предусматривает а, выездные а, консультационные сессии наших юристов на а, отдаленные сельские местности. То есть а, мы, наши юристы идут со своими услугами к населению и выявляют их проблемы и тем самим помогают. А, в концепции предусмотрены несколько категорий лиц, это малимущие, уязвимые слоя населения, а также лица с инвалидностью. То, то есть вот эти категории лиц являются как бы приоритетными бенефициарами нашей деятельности. За вот э, несколько лет нашей деятельности и э, анализ... Э, как бы работе наших юристов на местах показывает, что в Таджикистане э, лица с инвалидностью э, сталкиваются в основном со следующими проблемами. Во-первых, это определение инвалидности, то есть получение лицом данного статуса, статуса лица с инвалидностью. Другая проблема – это их доступ, доступ этих лиц к социальным, к социальным услугам и социальному обеспечению. Также оформление пенсии, жилищные вопросы и вопросы трудоустройства. К сожалению, бывают президенты, что недобросовестные работодатели неохотно принимают на работу лица с инвалидностью, что является действительно отрицательным значит, явлением. Также доступ лиц с инвалидностью к образованию. Хотя у нас заложено в законодательстве принцип недискриминации, тем не менее некоторые нормы законодательства анализ некоторых норм показывает, что в них заложена как бы скрытая дискриминация, латентная дискриминация. И, соответственно, наши юристы в таких случаях помогают лицам, которые обращаются с ним за помощью. И поскольку данная сессия посвящена стратегии оказания юридической помощи и не оставить никого за бортом, у нас имеется определенная стратегия, как оказать доступную правую помощь лицам с инвалидностью. Это прежде всего повещение потенциала наших юристов посредством проведения тренингов и обучающих семинаров. Также мы пользуемся институтами пара юристов и, соответственно, мы э, как бы обучаем э, пара юристов из числа име лиц, имеющих инвалидность. То есть э, э, за счет этого мы повышаем доверие лиц э, с инвалидностью, э, и э, они с охотой придут к нашим э, пара юристам из э, как бы, числа этих же лиц, и, соответственно, э, они могут э, как бы, перенаправляться к нашим юристам и э, получать соответствующую правовую помощь. Я 
хотел бы вот показать, иллюстрировать, как мы проводим совместно семинары. Это, значит, эксперты и тренинги из числа самих же лиц с инвалидностью проводят нашим юристам э, семинары и тем самым они обучают их навыками работы именно с этой категорией лиц. Слу э, следующая фотография, следующая картинка опять-таки показывает, как э, э, наши юристы э, импровизируют и как э, э, тем самым не, э, вот, тренера воспитывают в них, в них чувство как бы солидарности с лицом с инвалидностью, поскольку сама э, картинка показывает заклеенный рот, завязанные э, глаза, и там самим э, наши юристы э, почувствуют на себя те лечения, которые чувствуют э, лица с инвалидностью. И позвольте вот э, Буквально за пару минут я э, намечу, какие у нас планы на будущее и что еще мы можем сделать. Э, в нынешнем году Республика Таджикистан э, подписал конвенцию ООН по правам лиц с инвалидностью, о, о, права, о правах э, инвалидов и, соответственно, э, как бы сейчас составляется дорожная карта по имплементации, ратификации и имплементации данной конвенции. И мы намерены, наш центр намерен как бы всячески содействовать имплементации и соответственно реализации э, данной концепции. Также я сейчас разрабатываем законоп закон за законопроект о гарантированной государством юридической помощи, в котором, естественно, будем удалять особое внимание лицам с инвалидности. И дальнейшее повышение как бы, потенциала наших юристов и как бы, сотрудничество со СМИ и гражданским обществом является для нас приоритетом. Спасибо вам за внимание. Dear Mr. Nusrato, thank you so much for this very interesting speech because the rights of the persons with disabilities are at least 10% of the world's population. And if we compare the speeches from Turkish and Tajikistan uh, speakers, we see that the lawyers really need a much more than just being a very good lawyer. They need to, these skills, how to deliver the services to the marginalized groups. And we do have the second speaker from Turkey, Mr. Mutin Ozdemir, who is the head of the Department of Victims of Rights from the Ministry of Justice of Turkey, who will further speak on how to deliver the services to refugees, as Turkey is one of the best examples of uh, accepting the refugees during the last several years already. Değerli katılımcılar, hepinizi Türkiye Cumhuriyeti Adalet Bakanlığı adına saygıyla selamlıyorum. Due respect. As regards access to justice of Syrian refugees in Turkey, I would like to say that legal aid is an essential element for access to justice as required by the right to a fair trial under Article 6 of the European Convention of Human Rights to which Turkey is a party and also under the Article 10 of Turkey's constitution which enshrines equality before the law. I would like to start by thanking the organizers of this conference for giving me this opportunity to talk about the system of legal aid in Turkey. Access to justice and legal aid in Turkey. Before I start talking about that, I would like to give you some information about the legal aid system. There are three pillars. First is legal aid in criminal procedure. Uh, complaints filed by victims are free of charge. 
and cases filed after such complaints and reports are free from any filing fees or similar fees. We have Code of Civil Procedure, and as per the Code of Criminal uh, Procedure, uh, non-Turkish speaking or disabled suspects, accused victims or witnesses are provided with interpreters paid by the state. As per the same code, the suspect or accused is asked to choose a defender. If he she states that he doesn't have the financial means to afford the defender, the defender is assigned in line with his request. If the victim or those harmed by criminal offense are involved in the case and also in case of sexual assault and criminal offenses requiring a minimum sentence of more than five years in prison, they may ask the bar for assignment of a lawyer. The court assigns a lawyer without a request in the following cases. One, when a suspect is taken under custody when a person is brought before a judge with a request of detention, when the suspect or accused is a minor intellectually disabled, when the suspect or accused is involved in investigation and prosecution, when the victim or those harmed by the crime are minors or have uh, disabilities. So there is no means test. Those that fulfill the criteria described above are uh, provided with a defender, and those services are offered by the lawyers affiliated to the Bar Association and the fees are paid by the Ministry of Justice. In this respect, uh, there are no quota or there are no limits in the budget. There is no ceiling. Uh, so no matter how many victims or suspects uh, that are in need of legal aid, uh, those services are offered without a quota or limitation in the budget. The budget for mandatory defender an attorney assignment uh, as I said is not limited so uh, in 2018 the budget was almost 75 million dollars we also have legal aid in civil cases there is a differentiation the first is uh, when the person is poor and cannot afford the court expenses and filing fees uh, that person is exempted from those court expenses, filing fees, and attorneyship fees. The bar associations offer certain services. If people are poor and if they cannot afford lawyers, we have a legal aid system in civil cases, and the legal aid services are offered by the lawyers assigned by the bar associations. Uh, Turkey invests a lot in this system, almost. $27 million a budget was allocated to legal aid in civil cases. In recent years, the budget share has increased gradually. In this respect, starting from 1970s, the legal aid services, when the legal aid services were first initiated, uh, we have ensured some quality, but access to justice is a noble cause. Therefore, we are trying to invest more in the legal aid services to improve the capacity. Representative from the Union of Turkish Bar Associations also mentioned the project that we have implemented to improve the legal aid services in Turkey. In addition to that project, there was another project we implemented for capacity building. We implemented an EU twinning project strengthening legal aid services in Turkey. Uh, so as regards Syrian refugees, the Ministry of Interior established Directorate General of Migration migration management to manage the migrant uh, to manage the migrants population and this DG offers uh, services for protection accommodation 
and also offers other services to fulfill the needs of uh, the refugees, such as their legal needs. So we have our own budget, and DG Migration Management has its own budget. So a lot of uh, money has been allocated to prepare brochures for awareness raising, especially DG Migration Management prepared brochures in 13 different languages. The contact details of bars were indicated in those brochures, and the judiciary and legal system uh, of Turkey were described, and 100,000 copies were printed and put in removal centers, police stations, and gendarmerie stations in 13 different languages. Uh, the Ministry of Justice implementing implemented training courses to judges, prosecutors, and psychologists, social workers who are involved in the system of uh, legal aid. We also take into consideration the socioeconomic situation of the refugees, and we take necessary measures in order to fulfill their needs. I'm the department head of a victims' rights department in the Ministry of Justice. We have laid down a lot of objectives, and we are going to establish victim support offices in provincial areas in order to offer better services to vulnerable groups, particularly to the refugees. In this respect, these victim support offices will primarily be established in the southeastern provinces where uh, there is a dense population of refugees so that the refugees will be better represented before the court within uh, the necessary pro processes. Oh, we cooperate with UNDP Turkey Office as Ministry of Justice Department of Victims' Rights. We are thinking of implementing a project. Uh, and under the scope of that project, especially judges, prosecutors, uh, translators, interpreters, and psychologists, pedagogists, and social workers who are going to offer services to refugees will be trained uh, in Arabic language, and they will also learn about the legislation of Syria in order to better inform Syrian refugees so that the quality of services can be improved for the future. In this meeting, as the Republic of Turkey, uh, we had the opportunity to offer our experience. I would like to thank you very much for that opportunity. That's all from my side. I don't want to take much of your time. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Well, the next speech is dedicated to protection of a representation of those who are not the nationals of the country. So, with the over 250 million migrants worldwide, at least 10 million stateless persons, again worldwide, I do think that now we are going to discuss quite big marginalized groups that might not have proper access to legal aid in the different countries. And Ms. Anat Horowitz, Deputy Chief Public Defender of the State of Israel, will present the experience of Israel, how to ensure that the uh, persons who don't have the national, uh, nationality in Israel can have access to legal aid. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, Betsy, if you, Betsy, if you could put on the, the disc. Thank you. My name is Anat Horvitz, and I'm uh, the Deputy Public Defender of Israel. I would like to join in my colleague Nicholas and the rest of the members of the panel on the, in thanking all the many organizers of this uh, conference for a wonderful conference. We're on the third day. We can already not say it uh, based on expectation, but based on experience. It was great. And I want to thank our colleagues from Georgia for their warm hospitality and uh, and gracious welcoming. When we speak of, uh, leave, of effective strategies for leaving no one behind, which is the topic of our session, uh, what usually comes to mind are groups such as uh, persons with disabilities, children, women, minorities, and at least uh, in the experience of uh, our office, the public defender uh, in Israel, 
It took us some time to recognize that uh, our foreign clients, and I'm talking about foreign clients uh, as a different group than uh, minorities within uh, the country, um, require our special category of um, a marginalized group that require um, special attention. These clients have unique needs and the representation requires expertise and more often than not a, a creative approach. And um, in order to, of course, grant them a proper representation, the proper representation they deserve. Um, Dr. Yoav Sapir on the first day of this conference mentioned that our office represents any indigent uh, person who's involved in criminal proceedings in Israel, no matter what his or her nationality is. And in the short time of, uh, that I have at my disposal, I wanted to talk about the practicalities of representing foreign clients, not deliver uh, an academic uh, discussion or uh, exposition of what are the rights of uh, foreign uh, clients, but uh, rather describe several of the challenges we face in representing foreign clients and how we attempt to confront them. Not always successfully, but we, we do try. And in order to give you a concrete um, example of some of these difficulties and also to uh, to uh, being the sixth in line in, in making a presentation, also to try and use a different method. I thought to bring you a short clip from a, a movie that was made about public defenders in Israel, which uh, documents, uh, it's a true documentary, it's based on a true, a true interview that one of our public defenders held with a, a client from Ghana, and this is, of course is with her full uh, consent. So Betsy, uh, if you could uh, have some. It has subtitles, so even if you don't hear it, uh, you can follow it. Okay, let me, uh, perhaps till this uh, comes uh, up again, let me describe the case that's, uh, that, uh, that I wanted to show. Uh, it's an Israeli public defender, one of our external public defenders. We, uh, Yoav uh, Sapir mentioned our mixed model of working with internal and external public defenders, represented a, a woman from Ghana um, who was, um, was charged of reckless killing uh, as regards to a child who was uh, in her care at a daycare center in South Tel Aviv. Uh, this woman um, speaks Aachen. I hope I'm uh, pronouncing the language correctly, uh, which is the main dialect spoken in Ghana, but as you can imagine, it's, uh, it's not uh, widely known in Israel, and it was very hard to find a translator uh, to translate from this uh, language. Um, happily enough, the, the woman was finally acquitted at the end of her trial, but through the interview of the public defender, which I hope is uh, still going to come up, I wanted to demonstrate some of the problems uh, public defenders around the world, this is not a unique problem of public defenders in Israel, but it's a, unique, it's a problem that uh, public defenders face all around when dealing with foreign clients, the problems in communication between a local public defender and a foreign citizen. So, uh, Betsy, do we have any progress? Okay, so, um, so in this uh, particular interview, you can see the public defender reading out the indictment in English to the woman who's being accused. On the other hand, but, but unfortunately, the woman does not speak English, nor does the public defender speak Akin. So a translator was brought in in order to translate the indictment from English to Akin. So this is our public defender, Mr. Kevler. <laughs> Do you know where she was responsible for several babies? Among them, the baby that uh, unfortunately died that day. Uh, the morning of the 27th of May, at 10 o'clock approximately, he was brought to the kindergarten by his mother, 
and that day on his neck was hanging a pacifier with a string. Uh, the mother put the baby in one of the beds according to the instructions of the, of the uh, teacher or the uh, people who were in the place. Uh, when the string is on his neck and the pacifier is in his mouth. At 11 o'clock, Mama went, uh, Mama the defendant, went to the baby to feed him and found him uh, unconscious and not breathing. They say that his death was a cause from the negligence, negligence by Mama, uh, because she let him sleep when the street was a Mama, and because she didn't check. Betsy, we can stop here. Uh, and I, I just wanted to, sh um, to, to, to illustrate an, an, an example. M M Mama is a, a, a, a person who is, has a work permit to work in Israel. She, as our moderate, moderator said before, she's one of millions of uh, people around the world who go outside their home country in order to seek employment and unfortunately find themselves involved in criminal proceedings. They're overrepresented, as we heard uh, in, the, in the previous uh, session in criminal, uh, criminal uh, proceedings. And I assume that in all our uh, public defender's office or criminal legal aid agency, we see a rise in foreigners that um, that find themselves in criminal proceedings. And uh, as I think was well demonstrated here, the first barrier you have is the barrier of language. Now, I'm not going to go into, into detail about all the very many uh, international legal instruments which uh, attempt to ensure that people in criminal proceedings will have the right to a translator, will have all the documents translated. But as you can see, there's a huge gap between what the uh, legal norms provide and what happens in practice. In this case, uh, the, the public defender attempted to explain to the woman what the night wound was about. He does not speak Akan, so he spoke English. The English was translated by the interpreter to, uh, for the woman. It's hard to understand, you know, she seems quite bewildered. She's certainly bewildered by criminal proceedings in a foreign country. And, uh, and uh, it's, you know, anybody's guess to know what percentage of what was uh, written, actually written in the indictment, did she, uh, did she understand. Um, how, how, do, how do we uh, confront these cases? Well, in the context of our, our office, we try to employ as many as possible public defenders that speak foreign languages. It's one of, you know, provided that they're qualified, it's one of the things we seek when we uh, retain services of uh, external staff. And, uh, and in order to provide uh, uh, as many language speaking uh, pro uh, public defenders we can. Secondly, we have ongoing uh, connections with agencies that provide professional interpreters. Nonetheless, it's important to, to point out that in this particular case, we did not find a translator. And the person who is translating what the public defender said to the woman is an employee of Ghana's embassy in Israel. And this uh, uh, highlights a, uh, uh, a right that uh, is not always known around the world and um, it's certainly not implemented and that's uh, the right under section 36 of Vienna Convention on Consular Relations of 1963 which is part of customary law and therefore it applies even if there is not a national law in force. Uh, each person, uh, each foreign national who's arrested or detained must be given notice without delay of the right to have their embassy or consulate notified of their arrest. 
and consular officers should have the right to visit a national of the sending, prison who, uh, sending state who is in prison, custody, or detention. And there are many services that, uh, consul, uh, that the consulates and embassies can provide, one of them being translation services, as uh, is demonstrated in this case. The second barrier to representing uh, foreign citizens, and it was mentioned by one of my colleagues earlier, is the cultural one. Here it, uh, here it was demonstrated for people who followed the interview when the uh, public defender asked the interpreter, why is she not looking at me? Uh, referring to, to his client and not looking into eyes of someone, as we know, is also a cultural issue. And it is clear that uh, when we provide services to foreign clients, we have to provide training to make them more uh, sensitively cultured. The third barrier, and I'll rush through the rest of my presentation, is the consequences which a foreign national uh, um, faces as a result of being um, involved in criminal uh, proceedings. These consequences can um, include anything beginning from a revocation of the work permit, as in her case, and uh, up to, or a visa, up to a deportation or imprisonment. Therefore, it's vast importance that clients should be advised of the ramifications of their involvement in criminal proceedings so that they make informed uh, decisions throughout the proceedings as to how uh, to conduct their affair. In the United States, there's a specific uh, case in, that was handed down in 2010, Padilla versus Kentucky, which says that criminal defense counsel has a duty to address the migration consequences facing his non-citizen non defendants, and it seems that the rationale behind this decision applies worldwide. So what do you do in a criminal law agency such as ours where such expertise does not exist? We do not have lawyers on the staff who know much about uh, immigration. So first of all, we appointed a person within our internal staff to educate herself in this case about immigration law and to provide information for our staff and external uh, public defenders about immigration uh, possible cons consequences and other consequences that have to do with a criminal trial. And we have partnerships, which is another way of providing holistic uh, services, which was mentioned, I think, yesterday by Rick Jones. We have uh, external links to various organizations that we can refer our clients to when they need uh, to be represented in administrative uh, proceedings or others. And finally, and I come to my final point, uh, um, I apologize for uh, uh, talking beyond the limits of my uh, time uh, frame. The, the final point I would like to make, and when we're talking about the practical aspects of representing foreigners, is that very often in these cases, we require knowledge of foreign law. We need to know, uh, we need to, or foreign law or foreign practice. We need to collect uh, evidence from a foreign jurisdiction. S say that uh, in this case, which was, it was not necessary, we wanted to prove the medical background of uh, Mama for, and need information from Ghana concerning her medical information. Say she was about to be uh, deported or she, she was sent to prison and uh, was about to be transferred or requested to be transferred to her home country. What are the laws in, in force in that country regarding early release? What are the prison conditions? These are all issues that, again, we're not equipped to handle without uh, getting assistance from outside. And I would like to end by, uh, call, we are here, uh, a group of uh, public defenders or legal aid advocates from around the world, uh, this is an area that we can cooperate in, just like the prosecution and the police op have international cooperation systems and mechanisms. We could at least informally, uh, there's been much uh, discussion about a network, but at this stage, before such a network exists, we should informally um, um, uh, help, each, help out each other and, um, and assist in these matters so to ensure that also our foreign clients are not left behind. Thank you. Well, thanks so much. Uh, and uh, the last speaker for our session is Dr. Wendy O'Brien, who has a very difficult task to keep you concentrated, being the last person between you and the lunch. So Mr. O'Brien will once again highlight the very important issue, basically the empowering the right holders and the importance of the legal education for improving the access to justice. And then maybe 
we ca I can ask you to make, to make really seven minutes to just get at least one or two questions because we, we, we started like 20 minutes later. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished delegates. It's my pleasure to be here with you to join in this important conversation. And I'm pleased to speak on behalf of UNODC and the Education for Justice Initiative, which is a part of the global program for the implementation of the Doha Declaration. Okay. At the close of the 13th Crime Congress in Qatar in 2015, the Doha Declaration was adopted. This was a unique moment in which the rule of law and the post-2015 development agenda held the world's stage. The Doha Declaration affirms the imbrication of the rule of law and sustainable development and the foundational role that education on the rule of law plays in promoting access to justice for all. As a result of this declaration and with the um, donor, um, generous um, donor contribution from the state of Qatar, UNODC launched an ambitious global program on education. And this is education to teach younger generations about the importance of the rule of law, about a culture of lawfulness, and access to justice for all. And there are initiatives at the primary, secondary, and tertiary level I will speak to you primarily about tertiary, but I'll share a little information about the initiatives at primary and secondary as well. So at the primary level, there are a series of interactive uh, games and cartoons for children to teach about the values of fairness, integrity, and respect. So to frame this more broadly, uh, this presentation and this initiative is looking at the role that education globally can play in this broader conversation about leaving no one behind and specifically about addressing uh, the structures uh, that operate in many contexts that uh, perpetuate discrimination against those from vulnerable groups. So there's an underlying focus on non-discrimination through both the primary and secondary materials, and I'll talk in more detail about the way that that operates through the tertiary materials. I'll also briefly mention there that there is a game uh, which is about gender-based violence called Chuka, uh, which has been uh, uh, implemented in Brazil, and I understand there are plans for that uh, to be launched elsewhere as well, which is challenging the silence around gender-based violence and educating and empowering children that experience gender-based violence to actually report and speak up about that. At the secondary level, there are a range of non-electronic games that are teaching about UNODC mandates uh, that can be used in the classroom. So this is about materials for secondary teachers to assist them in teaching on these important issues. And there is also initiatives around model education, um, model United Nations conferences, which I won't unfortunately have time to speak about in detail because I want to talk to you about what we're doing with the tertiary level. So this is the production of more than 100 modules on UNODC mandates that can be used by university lecturers around the world. These will be open access. Some of them are already online. Open access, they're designed to be applicable for teaching in different disciplines. We're wanting to reach beyond students in criminology, beyond students in law. I should say uh, that I come to this role at UNODC from academia, uh, where I teach in criminology uh, and in human rights. And I would say that the interdisciplinarity that we have infused through these modules, I think, is something that will actually uh, ensure their enduring appeal. And one of the reasons, I think, when we start to talk about crime prevention and criminal justice and the myriad ways in which those from vulnerable groups are left behind, we know that the solutions to those problems are not residing in one single discipline. They're not within the law. This is not about sociology. This is not solely about social work. It's not solely about education. It's not about the medical profession. Indeed, it's about all of those disciplines and many, many more coming together and finding novel and collaborative ways to network to support vulnerable individuals uh, and to create the reforms that we need to ensure 
that vulnerable, uh, individuals from vulnerable groups uh, are not left behind. So the thematic um, areas are broad, uh, but I want to talk to you about the modules that we're developing on crime prevention and criminal justice. These are the 14 modules. Uh, and through these, um, I am going to have to race because I can see uh, that I'm getting hints from behind me, but through these modules there are a range of interconnecting themes. The plan is that they engage critical thinking, but that they also encourage students to think about practical application of the standards and norms within their local context. Um, with respect to legal aid specifically, I think it displays well on one side, but not on the other. Uh, these are derived from the UN principles and guidelines. These are principles uh, three and four. And I just wanted to point to this as an articulation of the transformative potential of legal aid, not just for individuals that require legal aid and receive it, and may find that their passage through the criminal justice system, or indeed, hopefully, their diversion from the criminal justice system uh, is affected through the provision of legal aid. But indeed that legal aid has, the, and education and awareness about legal aid has the potential to transform the criminal justice system more generally. And I think this is a very nice articulation of the way in which restorative justice, for example, and diversionary practices can be enlivened through education and information. Individuals cannot access legal aid, as we have heard uh, so uh, cogently over the last few days, if they are not aware of legal aid. So education, I think, is really fundamental with respect to this. Uh, perhaps there will be the opportunity for us to make our slides available to delegates after the presentations, because I'm not sure uh, that there will be time to talk about this in detail. But I do want to emphasize that the module series, the 14 modules that I put up earlier, are underpinned by a commitment to examining and encouraging students to critically examine the ways in which discrimination operates across multiple contexts. So I'll take two examples. There's a module on uh, gender in the criminal justice system. And this particular module uh, is looking at discriminatory law. We've heard a little bit about that this morning um, in the excellent panel this morning on discrimination, um, where uh, women, for example, can be prosecuted for crimes that simply don't apply to men. Um, and one of the things this particular module does is identify that where these discriminatory laws, I don't have time to talk about discriminatory procedures that surround uh, laws very often, including barriers to reporting, violence when women report, etc. Um, but that these are a crystallization of discriminatory stereotypes and structural injustices that operate more broadly. So barriers to educating girls, economic inequality. So what the modules do is instead of looking at the ways in which individuals are left behind uh, in a very narrow criminal justice sense, it's really broadening the scope uh, to actually encourage this interdisciplinary uh, and, and multifaceted analysis of the problems. Uh, and there's a nice slide on the practical um, strategies to address some of these problems and I won't have time at all to talk about that because I am out of time. So the only other thing that I want to say uh, in conclusion is that for the professors in the room, those who are from academia or indeed anyone who is interested in speaking with me about this, I would really invite you to, to come and introduce yourself to me. I would love to connect with you about ways in which we might partner to ensure that these modules uh, they're nearly ready to go online. They should be online by the end of the year. Um, these modules might be useful to you in your university departments. We might come together to co-host um, and collaborate on seminars to create awareness about these uh, around the world. And the intention is that they will be translated uh, and that we will do careful work in specific regions to ensure that the examples and the language and so on that is used in the modules is appropriate uh, and is going to resonate well uh, for students in that particular area. So it's not a one-size-fits-all one approach that we're taking. Thank you very much for your kind attention.
Uh, thank you so much, all speakers, and maybe just a very, very brief uh, summer, summer, uh, summary for our discussion. Like the first is when we talk about the marginalized groups, so we don't really mean necessarily the small groups of the people. Uh, the good finding was that all the speakers agreed that the marginalized groups do need the access to legal aid service, and we were talking about the special methodologies or the special challenges, how to ensure that the quality legal aid is accessible. Also, everybody agrees that the empowering of the right holders or the duty bearers in this case, the legal aid lawyers is also vital for provision of relevant legal aid services, and that a good legal aid lawyer needs more than just to know the articles of law. So this is a very brief summary, and do we have questions? I understand we want. So we, I have two and three, uh, three, sorry. So first, and please, Make sure you only use one minute for the question and we'll be as brief as possible with the answers. Thank you. Uh, I'm John from Samoa, a country within the Pacific region. Thank you so much for all the speakers for those educational presentations. My question is to my friend, uh, Professor David. You mentioned the important role of non-lawyers in assisting criminal accused in remote rural areas where there are no lawyers. And this is quite relevant to our context. Are there any challenges or problems faced by the vulnerable population for non-lawyers provide actual legal advice and legal representation in the court of law? And are there any effects in an administration of justice and the right of the vulnerable population for quality legal aid by the non-lawyers performing the roles of lawyers? Thank you. Uh. Isabel Astor, EODD Jordan. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for having included this session in the agenda. Uh, and also the speakers, particularly the speakers from uh, Turkey. I have one comment and a subsequent question to, to Turkey, whether Ministry of Justice or, or the Bar Association. Uh, the, my question relates to the uh, reach out of the refugees. Uh, Can you speak in the microphone, please? Uh -huh. My question relates to the reach out of the refugees, the tools and the methods. Uh, ERDD has been working and uh, providing legal aids in refugee camp situation in the Zatari camp in Jordan uh, and has established presence in the camp in order to make sure that uh, legal aid would be accessible to refugees in situ. Uh, in this context, it has uh, four licensed attorneys working in the, what is uh, the largest refugee camp in the Middle East, providing counseling, representation in court, mediation, and legal training. So my question would be, in the context of uh, Turkey, what is the reach out method strategy to the most vulnerable refugees, in particular uh, women from vulnerable backgrounds. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Carol, from the Danish Institute for Human Rights. Um, two points, we, we, we operate um, from Zambia. We operate in an environment with um, customary courts, you know, traditional authorities and chiefs handling disputes. And um, they are handling such disputes of a civil nature, but a lot of them are actually offenses, crimes, but that are just dealt with as a civil offense where uh, the plaintiff is actually asking for compensation only and people are not actually um, willing to report the case to the police and to the formal courts of law. So how do we engage with uh, the customary justice authorities, the traditional systems, uh, with customary law, and uh, we have a scheme where we bring together uh, the judiciary, traditional authorities and paralegals that are based in communities to discuss on who is handling what, which kind of cases, which ones should be referred. But this is something maybe for future conferences. I think uh, we can't avoid it, uh, that question. Um, and the other aspect, sometimes we tend to think that paralegals are useful when there's no lawyer available. 
but that's also our experience that in the criminal justice system, paralegals uh, are working side by side with the legal aid board lawyers. And even at uh, high court or subordinate court, you have team where you have the lawyers from legal aid board and the paralegals. And paralegals are um, an essential component, for example, uh, to liaise with the family, to contact people, to sign as a sureties, to contact the witnesses, to follow up on cases, which uh, tasks that the legal aid board lawyers cannot undertake because they are few and they are busy with representation in court. Uh, I'm extremely sorry we cannot take any extra questions, but I urge you to discuss during the lunchtime. So I believe Turkey delegation, Professor, you would like to answer in the first question. I would urge whoever would like to, yeah, to do whoever wants to, whoever wants to answer those questions. Thank you. Okay, J just the first one from a colleague from Samoa about the role of non-lawyers in remote areas, the problem about them giving legal advice and legal representation. Um, paralegals play th three roles, actually. One is usually to do awareness for people so that they understand what their rights are, wh when they need lawyers, what, what the law says, and everything else. The other one is there are certain limited things they can do. They can help people fill in forms and things like that. And the third important thing is they link with lawyers. Lawyers often see paralegals as enemies. They're not. They're actually partners because they have the link in the communities to the lawyers. In Fiji, they're careful about saying their paralegals can only give legal information. But there's a thin line between legal information and legal advice. In some countries, paralegals are not called paralegals. We heard yesterday in Djibouti, they, they scribes, people call scribes. They've only got 30 lawyers in the country. Scribes know more than the lawyers. And they do the work. They technically are, are paralegal. So there's a whole variety. But the big thing is, in most countries, lawyer, paralegals cannot appear in court to give legal representation. In some countries, the legal aid laws say they can give advice and assistance, and it's useful to spell that out, what sort of things. But when it comes to legal representation, even Malawi, where they had a paralegal court, they had a judge who had a six-month diploma. They had prosecutors who were police officers with three-month diplomas. The Bar Association never represented lawyers in fourth grade magistrates court, but they objected to paralegals with a one-year diploma, more qualified than the magistrate and the prosecutor for defending people then where there were no lawyers. So there's this huge problem with paralegals where we do put it into legal aid acts. We say they cannot hold themselves out as lawyers. They cannot charge individual fees. They have to be associated with an NGO or the legal aid board or whatever it is question of traditional customary law. It is important to um, train, as, as you've said, as you do train the traditional leaders, where we've put it, tried to put it into legal aid legislation. We've said they can use tra traditional dispute resolution methods, provided they're consistent with the country's constitution to protect fundamental rights. But you need, in Malawi, they're very good, because they will say, look, go to the regular court. This is to the magistrate, don't waste your time charging a guy with, with stealing a chicken that's clogging up the court. Send him to the traditional court. They'll make the guy pay two chickens, restorative justice. So they play a useful role. Same time, paralegal says to the traditional chief, don't, you cannot do a case by paying a cow when you, your uncle deflowers a young girl. That is against public policy. That case must go to the formal justice system. But paralegals are not enemies of lawyers. They are partners, and they're not enemies of the formal justice system. They're partners as well. Ben de Ürdünlü katılımcının sorusuna kısmen cevap vereceğim. Başkanım da baroların bu konudaki destek hizmetlerinden kısaca bahsedecek. Tabii biz zaman baskısı altında olunca detaylı bir sunum yapamadık. Konuşma metnini hızlı bir şekilde yapamadık atlamak zorunda kaldım. Şimdi e, Türkiye'de bizim e, mültecilere yönelik e, sunduğumuz adli yardım hizmetlerine yönelik en önemli e, özellikle kadınların, çocukların bu hizmetlerden etkin bir şekilde faydalanabilmesi için e, yaptığımız en önemli şey e, göç kabul merkezi, jandarma, polis ve mahkemeler ve savcılıklarla ilgili e, bu kişilerin başvuracağı kurumlara yönelik olarak 
e, bilgilendirici broşürlerin özellikle kendi lisanlarında anlayabileceği e, Türkiye'de şöyle de bir zorluk yaşıyoruz. Belki Ürdün'de böyle bir zorluk olmayabilir. Bizim e, hukuk sistemimiz e, Avrupa Birliği'ne e, daha yatkın, kamu düzenine ilişkin farklı farklı kurallarımız var. Mesela Türkiye'de e, tek evlilik geçerli. İşte Suriyeliler içerisinde birden fazla evlenen kişiler var. Evlilik yaşıyla ilgili problemler var. Bundan kaynaklanan da uygulamada sıkıntılar var. Yani bizim Türk hukukunu mu uygulayacağız? Onları mı uygulayacağız? Tabii biz kamu düzeni ilkesi gereğince kendi hukukumuzu uyguluyoruz. Buna ilişkin Türkiye'nin hukuk sistemlerini, e, hak arama yollarını e, etkin bir şekilde e, kendilerine iletebilmeleri için öncelikli olarak e, göç kabul merkezinde çalışanlar, jandarmalar, polis memurları ve e, hakimler, savcılara yönelik etkili bir eğitim e, modelimiz var ve afişlerimiz, broşürlerimiz hep e, çadır kentlerde, kamplarda mevcut. Yine e, diğer taraftan da hizmet sağlayıcılara yönelik de özellikle e, avukat meslektaşlarımıza yönelik e, çok sayıda eğitimler gerçekleştirildi. Başkanım bahsettiği gibi hukuk kliniği uygulamaları, e, buna baş, e, bunun yanında etkili hizmet sunumuna ilişkin birçok metot e, geliştirildi projeler kapsamında. Bu metotlar uygulanıyor. Yine e, bahsettiğim gibi tercüme hizmeti de çok önem arz ediyor. Çünkü e, yani bilmediği bir dille e, kendini savunmasını, ifade etmesini mağdur için beklememiz çok zor. Onun için tercümanların da yani dile yatkınlığından öte e, hukuki literatüre de yatkın olması amacıyla yani çok fazla bir eğitim e, veriyoruz tercümanlara da. E, adli işlemlerde bu tercümanları kullanıyoruz. E, yani biz elimizden geldiği kadar e, farklı medol, model ve teknikleri e, mülteciler için de geçerli kılıyoruz. Yani bizim Türk vatandaşına sağladığımız haklar neyse adli yardım anlamında mültecilere de diğer yabancılara da aynı haklar ücretsiz olarak sunuluyor. Ben kısaca böyle cevap vermek istiyorum. Başkanımın ekleyeceği bir husus varsa. Sayın Genel Müdürümün ifade ettiklerinin dışında Türkiye'de yaşayan mültecilerin çok küçük bir kısmı kamplarda yaşıyor. Diğer ülkelerde çoğunluğu kamplarda yaşarken Türkiye'de çok küçük bir kısmı kamplarda yaşıyor. Büyük bir kısmı 3,5 milyonu normal Türk vatandaşlarıyla birlikte Türkiye içinde yaşıyor. Bu Türkiye içinde yaşayan e, mülteciler için barolarımız farkındalık yaratıp onların ihtiyaçlarıyla sahada ilgilenme durumuna girebiliyor. En çok mülteci barındıran bir ilimiz var Urfa. 500 bin mülteci o ilimizde o yörede bir hukuk kliniği oluşturduk. Hem sahada hem de kendilerine başvuranlara her türlü konuda hukuki yardım, psikolojik yardım, sosyal yardım, gerekli olan desteklerin tümünü e, projemiz kapsamında vermekte. Her baro e, ya başvurulduğunda kendilerine hukuki konularda destekler sağlanmakta. Dolayısıyla Türk vatandaşlarına sağlanan tüm ayrıcalıklı hizmetler kendilerine de sağlanmakta. E, dolayısıyla bu büyük sorunu bu şekilde birlikte çözmeye çalışıyoruz. Elimizden geldiğince de takdir edersiniz bu çok büyük bir sorun. Çok kolay değil. Konuşmamın içinde de söylemiştim. Bir ülkenin nüfusu kadar bir nüfusu bir anda içinize aldığınızda bunun sorunlarını çözebilmek hakikaten çok zor. Çok farklı çok farklı kültürlerden gelen insanlarla yan yana oluyorsunuz. Çok farklı hukuk sistemleriyle yan yana oluyorsunuz. Ve dolayısıyla bunları entegre etmek zannediyorum ki belli bir zamanı alacak. Türkiye olarak elimizden gelen bütün gayretleri kullanıyoruz. Teşekkür ederim.